In this part, we'll explore a few basic building blocks in Haskell, including functions, types, and modules, while building a small HTML printer library, with which we will later construct HTML pages from our markup blog posts. We'd like to be able to write different HTML pages without having to write the whole structure of HTML and body text over and over again. We can do that with functions. To define a function, we create a definition like we saw previously and add the argument names after the name and before the equal sign. The argument names will be available in scope on the right side of the equal sign in the expression. So let's define a function that takes a string, which is the content of the page, and wraps it in the relevant HTML and body tags by concatenating them before and after the content. We use the append operator to concatenate two strings. This function wrapperHTML takes one argument name content and returns a string that prefixes with HTML body tags before the content and appends body HTML tags after it. Note that it is common to use camel case in Haskell for names. Now we can adjust our myHTML definition from the previous chapter. Again, notice that we don't need parentheses when calling functions, because if you remember, functions have the following form, first the name and then the arguments. However, if we want to substitute my HTML with the expression that my HTML is bound to in the main function, we would have to wrap the expression in parentheses. If we accidentally forget it and write it this way, we'll get an error from the compiler stating that the function is applied to two argument, but it only takes one because the compiler thinks that we have a function and two arguments instead of function and arguments. By using parentheses, we can group together the expression in the right order. So a quick aside about operator precedence and fixity. So the operators like append we saw before are infix functions which take two arguments, one from each side. When there are multiple operators in the same expression without parentheses, the operator fixity left or right and precedence and number between zero and 10 determine which operator binds more tightly, so to speak. In our case, append has right fixity. So the Haskell adds invisible parentheses on the right side of append. So for example, when we have string append and content append another string, the Haskell views it as a string append with another part in parentheses. And for an example of precedence in the expression one plus two multiplied by three, the plus has precedence six and the multiply has precedence seven. So we give precedence to multiply over plus. And this is how Haskell gonna view it. You first you multiply and then you sum. You may run into errors when mixing different operators with the same precedence, but different fixity. In cases like this, we have to help the compiler and explicitly put the parentheses. Let's do some exercises. This is your three second warning to stop watching and do the exercises yourself. First exercise is to separate the functions into two functions, one for the HTML and one for the body. So in case of HTML, we just keep the HTML part or HTML tags. And in case of body, we keep only body tags. The second one is to change my HTML to use two functions. Instead of having one function for this, we just use the two functions directly. Third exercise is to add another two similar functions for the text head and title. This one is pretty similar to the first exercise. Instead, we do head and the title. We just have to practice our copy paste skills. The next exercise is to create a new function make HTML, which takes two strings as an input, one for the title and one for the body. Now we bring back the make HTML function, but in this case, we need the title and the content. So HTML consists of the head, which has a title, and the body, which has a content. Spoiler alert, we can put it on the next line using editation. And the last exercise is to make use of new make HTML in my HTML instead of using all the functions directly. And last but not least, we use the make, make HTML with the body we had before and a new title. And a quick check that everything works. So we have our HTML, which has a head with a title and the body. Everything seems to be open and closed. Okay, I spoiled this a bit, but you might ask yourself, how does Haskell knows a definition is complete? There are no semicolons or figure braces anywhere. The answer is Haskell uses indentation to know when things should be grouped together. Indentation in Haskell can be a bit tricky, but in general, code which is supposed to be part of the same expression should be indented further than the beginning of that expression. And we know that two definitions are separate because the second one is not indented further than the first one. A few indentation tips. You have to choose a specific amount of spaces for indentation 
documentation. Two spaces, four spaces, and stick to it. And you should always use spaces over tabs. Do not indent more than once in any given time. And when in doubt, drop line as needed and indent once. So here's a few examples. First, as we've seen that already with MakeHTML, you can drop stuff on the new line with two spaces. If you want, you can make four spaces, but my auto formatter is gonna move it backwards to two, but you can do it four and it's a valid house call. If we want one more level, just a new line and edit even more. And we should be careful to avoid something like this. This is valid house call, but it's kind of ugly and not gonna pass any PR reviews. Next chapter is about adding type signature. Haskell is a statically typed programming language. That means that every expression has a type and we check that the types are valid with regards to each other before running the program. If we discover that they are not valid, an error message will be printed and the program will not run. An example of a type error would be if we'd pass three arguments to a function that takes only two or pass a number instead of a string. Haskell is also type inferred, so we don't need to specify the type expressions. Haskell can infer from the context of the expression what its type should be and that's what we did up until now and you might notice my IDE was smart enough to show the types without specifying or even asking for them. However specifying types ourselves is useful. It adds a layer of documentation for you or others that will look at the code later and it helps verify to some degree that what was intended with the type signature is what was written with the expression. It's generally recommended to annotate all top level definitions with type signatures. We use double colon to specify the type of names. Here's a few examples of types we can write. In the type of integer number string, which is the type of the strings. Bool, the type of booleans. Unit, the type of the expression is unit. The type of a function from an expression of type A to an expression of type B. And IO of unit. We'll talk about this one later. Let's specify the type of title. I don't have to, I can just cheat. Now we can explicitly see in the code that title is a function that takes a string and returns another string. Let's also specify the type of make HTML or make it explicit. Previously we thought about make HTML as a function that takes two strings and returns a string. But as you can see now, all functions in Haskell take exactly one argument as an input and return exactly one value as output. It's just convenient to refer to functions like makeHTML as function with multiple inputs. In our case, makeHTML is a function that takes one string argument and returns a function. The function it returns takes a string argument as well and finally returns a string. The magic or explanation here is that the arrow is right associative, which means that when we write the expression with no parentheses, Haskell parses like this. As a consequence, the expression make HTML my title is also a function, one that takes a string, which is a content, the second argument of make HTML, and returns the expected HTML string with my title in the title. This is called partial application. To illustrate this, let's define HTML and body functions in a different way by defining a new function element. Element is a function that takes a tag and the content and wraps the content with the tags. First we open a tag, then we put a content, and then we close the tag. Now we can implement HTML and body functions by partially applying element and only providing the tag. So we can replace this with the HTML. Note that we don't need this arguments on the left side of equal sign because Haskell functions are first class. They behave exactly like values of primitive types like integers or strings. We can name a function like any other value, put it in the data structure, pass it to the function and so on. And thanks to partial application, remove the content and do the same for the body. You can think of it this way. The way Haskell treats names is very similar to copy-paste. Anywhere you see HTML function in the code, you can replace it with its expression, which is element HTML. They are the same. This is what the equal sign says, right? That the two sides are the same. This property of being able to substitute the two sides of the equal sign with one another is called referential transparency. And it's pretty unique to Haskell and a few similar languages such as PureScript and Elm, which are pure. We'll talk more about referential transparency in the later chapter. To further drive the point that Haskell function functions are first class and all functions take exactly one argument, we can mention that the syntax we've been using up until now to define function is just a synthetic sugar. We can also define anonymous functions, functions without a name anywhere we like. Anonymous functions are also known as lambda functions as the tribute to the formal mathematical system which is at the heart of all functional programming languages, the lambda calculus. We can create an anonymous function anywhere we'd expect an expression, such as hello string for example, using the following syntax. This little thingy here which bears 
bear some resemblance to the lower Greek letter lambda, marks the head of the lambda function. The arrow marks the beginning of the body of the function. We can even chain lambda functions, making them multiple argument functions, so to say, by defining another lambda in the body of another. Just as before, we evaluate functions by substituting the function argument with the applied value. We can substitute num1 with 1 and substitute num with 2 and get 1 plus 2. We'll talk about substitution later in the book. So when we write this element function, Haskell actually translate this under the hood to the lambdas. Hopefully this form makes it a bit clear why Haskell functions always take one argument, even when we have synthetic sugar that might suggest otherwise. Well, actually there is one more synthetic sugar for anonymous function. We don't have to write multiple argument anonymous function this way. We can merge these two together. But it's worth remembering what they actually are under the hood. We won't be needing anonymous or lambda functions at this point, but we'll talk more about them later and see where they can be useful. Let's do more exercises. First one, add types for all the functions we created until now. Well, this is going to be easy because the code provides all of it for free. Change the implementation of the HTML function we built to use element function instead. So we simplified this one to the head and simplify this one to the title, thanks to the new element function. And add a couple more functions for defined paragraphs and headings. P, which is used for the paragraphs, and H1 for headings. Header first, and then the paragraph. And replace our hello world string, which richer content using H1 and P. We can append HTML strings created by H1 and P using the append operator. Instead of simple content hello world, we can write hello world header plus, and then we're gonna add a paragraph. Looks pretty good to me. Okay, seems like it's working. Beautiful blog post. In the next part, we'll discuss embedded domain specific languages and learn to construct safer HTML constructions by using types.